Hey everyone, uh, my name is Masood. Uh, I'm going to be presenting the original paper on uh, residual networks, uh, also known as deep residual learning for image recognition, um, which is um, one of the most cited uh, papers uh, in computer science, and I guess even uh, on Google Scholar, I saw like whole domains of uh, research. It was more than 25,000 citations. And uh, it was uh, first initiated at uh, Microsoft Research Group uh, with um, Kaming He. And um, it was a very uh, revolutionary idea that uh, they added uh, in a deep learning um, community. And uh, after that, it uh, really uh, influenced a lot of papers afterwards. And uh, even uh, right now, the state of the arts um, image classification uh, networks and uh, algorithms, they are. Uh, they have like this idea uh, in the heart of them. And uh, because this um, session is a foundational stream and uh, we, we want to talk about foundational papers, um, I chose this one and um, Ramia and Amber will help me to facilitate the discussions at the end. Um, just feel free to ask questions if uh, anything was, uh, you were curious about something and uh, let me know. Uh, or if it was a long question, we can uh, add it to the discussion points at the end. Um, so deep learning and question is um, usually a very good question to ask in deep learning is how deep uh, should we make our neural networks and um, why even should we uh, make them deeper? Do we need them all the time or not? And here is a simple um, uh, example that you can see for two different tasks, which was one of them is MNIST, a very uh, 101 uh, data set of machine learning and uh, data science and all these uh, fields. Uh, MNIST data set was the handwritten uh, recognition task uh, of zero to nine uh, digits. And as you can see, it has only 10 classes, 60,000 uh, training images, and uh, they use 10,000 sam samples for testing. Uh, this one, in comparison with ImageNet data set, which was uh, out, I guess, 2012, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, it was one of the uh, big points in the deep learning community, and it was uh, the initiation of uh, high leaps in this field. And ImageNet data set has more than 1.2 million images uh, for training, and uh, they use uh, percentage of that for validation and uh, 100,000 test samples, which runs on the test server, and uh, you can run your model and see uh, what is the accuracy. And they uh, have like about 1,000 classes, and also they measure uh, top five accuracy and top one accuracy on the data set. So as you can see here, uh, in order to solve such a problem as MNIST, we probably wouldn't need that much of parameters in order to model this, uh, like the, to, in order to model a function from our input, which are the images, and our output, which is which number is that, which class this number belongs to. And uh, compare that to the ImageNet, we for sure need a more complicated uh, model in order to solve this problem. So. When we go towards the spectrum of very simple uh, tasks to very complicated tasks, we tend to go deeper and deeper in order to find a very um, um, the higher level uh, information in those uh, images and samples. Uh, that's, that's basically the reason we need to go uh, further and further and deeper. Um, so as I said, it depends on the task at hand, depends on the capacity that we have, how much capacity do we have in training time, how much capacity do we have uh, on uh, inference time. Let's say we want to run a model uh, on an edge device, let's say our cell phone. Uh, so it cannot be like 10 GPUs or uh, 500 TPUs as ExcelNet was <laughs> trained on. And it's impossible. So these are the concerns that you have to um, take into account. And also, can we train our networks uh, efficiently uh, with the current optimization uh, solvers that we have in hand? And also, uh, the, the other question is, if we just add m more layers to our network, would it work? Like, would it just be better? Um, so the answer is no. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so why is not okay to just add more layers? There are a couple problems uh, that can be addressed by adding 
more and more layers to our network, and uh, one of them is vanishing or gradient uh, or uh, exploding gradients uh, of um, the model, uh, which was addressed by batch normalization and uh, uh, intermediate normalization of layers. As we go forward, we normalize them, and it was a great um, solution for the problem that uh, was daunting at the time. And uh, the other problem that raises the gradation problem and uh, question is what should we do about it. But first, let's uh, see what is the gradation problem uh, per se. So here uh, is an example, imaginary example of, uh, let's say, image classification. And um, let's say we want to classify a couple of images. It's a hypothetical um, task at hand. And we uh, designed this simple neural uh, network, convolutional neural network, with three uh, layers of convolutions. and one fully connected and one self nice layer. And uh, let's say we have the accuracy of X percent on this task. So ideally, if we add four more layers, let's say, four more layers to this um, architecture, and they're just identity. So whatever is the, at the output of uh, our uh, conv of the third layer, we just have identity after. So, all the, all the outputs of here will be transferred to the full connected node. So there's no difference, basically, right? We have more layers, but no more parameters. It's just uh, multiplied by one, right? Um, so the accuracy should be X percent again, right? But the problem happens when we add nonlinear layers. And let's say we add more and more uh, nodes and neurons to the network. So when we add a couple of more convolution layers uh, to the network, the accuracy actually drops. And we have always this uh, uh, thought in mind that, OK, more parameters tend to overfit on data. Yeah, of course. But it shouldn't give us less, uh, like, uh, less accuracy on the training set, right? It should raise the accuracy on training set. And obviously, it will work very worse on the test set. So what happens here is, no, actually it drops the accuracy on the, our training. And um, as you can see here, it's one of the uh, plots that they show uh, in the paper. As you can see, on a regular network, for 20 layers and 56 layers, our training error and test error actually increases, which we should take into account that it's not overfitting. And they call it the gradation problem. Um, so again, note, this is not overfitting. And um, instead of having more accuracy, we have less. Um, so in this paper, they uh, present an idea uh, which is called residual learning and uh, residual functions. This residual learning states that uh, given the fact that we have one input, like a couple of input samples, and we want to map them to an output, a couple of classes, or any kind of task that we have in hand. So this mapping, let's call this function hx. And hx is the function that we want to approximate in all most of uh, machine learning, uh, modeling, and uh, problems that we uh, try to solve. So the idea they have is they say, let's uh, present a new uh, representation of our network, which is called fx. And this, we want to learn this fx. And along with this fx in parallel, we give the network the ability to have the identity mapping from the input to the output as well. So we have fx representation, a new representative, which is not hx. And as you can see, FH, fx is defined by hx minus x, which is obvious from this diagram, right? So um, what happens here is that, let's say we want to learn the identity layers that we showed here. Right? If we want to learn, like, these cons be identity mappings uh, of that layer, with this type of architecture, we would be able to say, OK, if fx needs to be identity, it, during the training and uh, during um, our gradient descent and backpropagation, it will tend to be 0. Then we don't have any weights on fx. So it just be one uh, skip connection or the identity mapping from x to x. So we just have x passing through the network, and it's all good. So we have just that three uh, layers that we had uh, in the beginning. 
So this residual block uh, with more details, uh, as they describe it in the paper, is uh, consists of two layers, one nonlinearity in the middle, uh, which they use ReLU, uh, rectified linear, linear unit for it, and the X connection is identity, and uh, they will add X and FX representation, um, they pointwise um, addition, and then they use another nonlinearity and pass it to, to the next uh, unit of the whole network. Um, so this one, like using this approach that they uh, mentioned, uh, network itself with, with uh, say, do I need to learn more stuff or I'm just good? I don't need more information and I, I'm just good with identity and let's keep that. And uh, also they shown that it helped to uh, converge f faster than the um, optimizations on uh, a non-referenced uh, neural network, which doesn't have skip connections. And uh, the good thing about it, is, this uh, approach is that we don't add any other parameters. So we don't make our uh, model bigger and bigger and more parameters, per se, and uh, which is uh, an, a very fair comparison between these two approaches. And uh, it also helps us to go deeper and deeper, and let's say we have image that data set, we want more deep uh, you know, representation of the data and uh, our data set in hand, so we will be able to add those layers and uh, gain that um, representation, basically. Yeah? Can you explain the first What? Can you explain the first bullet point again? Okay. Here? Yeah. Um, so um, I, I get back to this diagram here. So let's say you add 100 layers to it, right? And we have this skip connections between uh, each layer. So if it doesn't need to uh, learn, like it doesn't tend to learn uh, new information or like add more parameters to data, it just simply uh, converges uh, the weights of that layer to zero, and that would be just one skip connection of x. So you're basically passing x to, towards the network. So that's what I meant by that. So I just got one point here. Yeah. Is that, um, so every, uh, every uh, rest block, in the, actually the gradient is under trying to make sure those count nodes, the gradient of count nodes come close to the zero. So which means that it is something like you have the x and you add some small correction. So every in, inside every rest net, you and the, the fx is like uh, has the ability to add a correction to the x. So every time they're trying to correct what is x supposed to be, then something like you are adding the uh, small correction. And because um, uh, usually uh, your network like takes more effort um, uh, to predict the things far away from the zero, but it is very good to predict the things um, close to the zero. So, uh, so that is why the ResNet is very useful and very fast to converge. And for this uh, so for this problem is that it just uh, seems like that you are adding the small correction to the X. And every time like they, in the first correction, in the first ResNet, you have, I said, uh, um, it is not the true, but uh, you just can imagine that if X is five, then FX um, like the, F, the uh, fx in the two uh, count layers, they have the like say the one, and so in this uh, the output of the first uh, uh, rest net supposed to be the six. So that means they and you, you add another uh, red rest block, and so this one supposed to you um, this eight six is your the uh, uh, is your uh, identity function, and you are trying to add another, uh, maybe two count layers, like the, let's say the fx, and supposed to be the maybe 0 0.5. So uh, every time you are, you are, what you are doing is you are trying to add small correction to the original um, your input factors. So that is uh, that is what the ResNet is supposed to be to go to the output. Um, okay, so. Uh, it might like uh, it might not be zero, um, like absolutely zero. Close to the zero. Yeah, it might be close to zero. So it's adding some information. It's uh, learning some new information to add today. Yes. But uh, I mean, like hypothetically, they say 
if it doesn't need to learn that, like we just uh, it would just merge us to zero and it would just be x. Yeah, so it's very fast to converge and fast to learn those, uh, so faster to optimize the uh, this those gradients. The reason of re re uh, really fast to fast find the min the minimums. That's the reason. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have a question about the, um, the architecture here. So I have a question. Why do you do two layers and then you add the x? Why not just add the x per layer? Because it doesn't change the number of parameters. So in theory, it shouldn't increase computational time. And why would you put two layers instead of one? Why it would be yeah. put? So the thing is, um, FX tries to also add nonlinearities, right? So when we, when we want to learn something, we want to have the nonlinearity of the data set. Like we want to uh, define a nonlinearity in our uh, representation. So if, if you, we just have, let's say, one layer and we just add x, there's no nonlinearity defining that fx. But th this way, they would be able to, first of all, have a more concrete way of learning, like with two different layers, there's, there are more parameters to learn and uh, a more maybe sophisticated representation as fx. And also we have nonlinearity in here, and then we add xx, and then again a nonlinearity and go forward. Shall I add something? Yeah, of course. So um, you're, yeah, are you saying that this weight layer, why do you have two instead of one? Mm -hmm. I think this is variable actually. So this x that you're talking about is added to the weight layer, and then it goes into the relative function. And nevertheless, this weight, like the number of weight layers, is variable. It's like you can okay. have any block in between. Okay, so you it could, could also be two, three, four. Five. Yeah, that's the whole idea of it, right? And that's the thing that they use in their uh, like training. There's uh, one block of uh, for image uh, training. They use a bottleneck uh, architecture. They use three layers uh, in order to um, make it less, you know, computationally and expensive and uh, to make it doable. But uh, the general idea is that I'm, a lot of people have used that idea of residual networks in different papers. And, okay. yeah. I guess I'll just yeah, just, So uh, just follow up with the statement from Amber. So saying that fx is just a small correction to the x value. What if it's actually fx is large value? Like, you know, it's not a small correction. It's, could it be uh, a possibility that fx is actually like FX learns more and more. Yeah, like. because this, I thought that skip connection or skip uh, this is basically uh, if if the layer that we skip doesn't learn anything, right? Yes. So that's why you just skip X to the next one, right? Yes. What if it actually learns something? And it will. So, so you still add it, so, the FX. So to the X. thing is, if in in worst case, if we add this identity and we learn nothing, it would be the same accuracy, right? So if we don't learn anything and it's just identity mappings, it would be just the same layers that we had from the beginning and identity, all of them, all the layers, so it would be exactly the same accuracy mathematically, right? But uh, they shown that uh, in the next slides I will show you that they actually, with 56 layers, they ended up like with less error. So it actually learns more and more stuff. Because we have a deeper representation, we, we end up learning more and more. We, we just don't, don't need to just add layers. OK, we just have, need to have the same accuracy. What's the point of it? So we have the, a very simple model which does that. But we need to gain more depth in order to learn more. And if it doesn't want to learn, we skip it. Like It would skip. That layer. So that's the whole, the whole idea. Yes. Yeah. I just, I just answering. I just, I, mean, I can, I think I can answer your question. So, um, I found that there is a paper called Very Lighting. They lost landscape uh, of the neural networks, and actually, uh, they, I think they actually uh, uh, figured out how to realize the loss uh, surface uh, from the different architecture of the neural network. So, and. Um, they are so just thinking that, uh, just just think, think about that you you have you draw a picture uh, uh, of the lost 
surface after 56 layers, let's say 56 layers, um, without the skin connection. So you can imagine that uh, the X and Y axis, uh, the, uh, the, they have two projection X and Y in one space, and the Z is the uh, represents the um, loss function. So they, uh, you can think that the surface is supposed to be very dumpy. So there are a lot of the hues and the valleys. So uh, it is. Um, very hard to let the optimizer to go, how to go to the uh, global minimum because it just it cannot go anywhere just stuck on the any what I random the, the local or narrow minimums. But if you have the if you just draw a picture uh, draw or image to represent the uh, 56 layers with the skin uh, connections that you will find out it has a smooth uh, surface of the smooth. Uh, loss surface, so which means that it is much easier to let optimizer to, to find co coverage and find the global minimum. So you have a small, the, I think it's just a small, the, the difference between the smoothness of the different architectures. Uh, Some related question. Uh, is there any intuitional way of understanding why the identity map is harder to learn than the zero map? Uh, what do you mean, zero map? Like uh, f of x is equal to if, zero. If 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 your if your if your if your players yeah uh, they learn weights such that they uh, it goes to the zero. Yeah. Why can we learn the identity? Yeah. Why 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 is uh, because because it's basically the uh, this residual term. It just shifts. Your, yeah, I know. So that right? so that is that? exactly the degradation problem that you're mentioning. So degradation problem, like uh, we, we are going to discuss it at the end, if so anyone... That's something. So all these processes that you talk about are stochastic processes. So it's, it's like randomized, so it's during the process of learning itself is randomized. And that's why when you, you, when you see these stochastic processes, it's easier to learn to, like learn zero than to learn one, which is a specific what? number, identity. Right, zero, zero is also a specific well, number. Well, probably can go back to the slides. Yeah. I am just looking, f uh, I will ask you a question about why the... Um, why this can't be uh, identity. Two, yeah, these two. Why well, we I, can't I, I, learn identity I, weights, I, I, right? I'm asking why, why identity is a very simple function. Yes. Why is it surprisingly uh, difficult to learn when you have a sigma sequence of multiple layers? Mm -hmm. But one layer is is it is it and why zero does not suffer the same drawback? Is this the property of the rectifier function? Is it related to something? That else? adding non-linearities maybe. Can I suggest something? It yes. sounds like a combative question. Okay. So let's come back to it in a second. Is that okay? Um, actually, I, I, think I, can, small, uh, I, can, you know, I, I think I can answer comment this. Comment on this. Uh, the reason that uh, learning zero-sign chopping is uh, easier is that uh, we go back to number of degrees of freedom. If you want to learn zero, you can easily change the bias, increase the bias, a small number of freedom, mm -hmm. and you can learn this easily. Okay. But if you want to learn, uh, you know, uh, identity function, number of Parameter that yeah. you should map, you should learn the optimal value is way higher. So okay, so okay, so we have drop of dimensionality for zero. It yes, reduce, yeah. reduce dimensions drastically. Yeah, and or less. Simply, like, simply put, you can say that you have W, you have this affine function Wx plus B, right? So you are learning what W is, what B, B is. So if you simply, like, why is it easy to learn zero? Because as effectively, if all these parameters tend to zero, the answer is zero, right? But if you want to exactly make it equal to one, it takes, like, as he's saying, it's more difficult for you to, you know, modify it in such a way that W, X, plus so B simply becomes, multiply anything yes, with zero and Yeah, the zero. affine function but actually tends to be zero. In in order to it's more difficult for you to, that's why, you know, when you say it's zero is also, you know, a specific number. If you want to but learn A, it's easy to learn. You have to and multiply it by one all, it's... all tend to zero, beat all tend to zero. It becomes zero, right? And also there is one paper where they discuss about this this problem of when your network is complex, um, like how the, there's a time cost associated. And when there's a time cost associated, um, you know, generally it's it's difficult for you to learn these parameters. That's why it's impractical to have 
uh, a very deep, a very very deep uh, architecture uh, without skip connections because of the time that it takes to to get the up the optimal values. And and that's why in this paper they say that the degradation problem itself is uh, it stems from the fact that it's easier to to learn like to learn zero as compared to one. And that's exactly why what they do is that they short circuit it and they, they, they kind of add X to say that, you know, now you have X in front of you. That's it. That's fine. Yeah. So, uh, let's move on. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is the original architecture uh, as they, uh, they've shown in the paper. And as you can see here is a 34 layer plane network without any skip connections. And uh, this one is a 34 layer residual network. And um, if you can see the connections uh, in different, like two layers, two layers, two layers, and uh, there are a couple of different colors which states uh, different dimensionalities of uh, the convolutions that we have. So the feature maps that we have, uh, they're, they're divided uh, into a couple of groups of um, cons uh, stacked together. And as you can see here, it's a dotted line connection. And what does this mean? It's a connection between two different units, right? So when we have uh, here, they're all like three by three columns of 64 uh, feature maps uh, by size of 64, and they're all the same. So when you skip the connection, you don't need to do anything else. You just add X. But what if we want to go uh, like to, uh, let's say we do pooling, and uh, we have uh, like smaller uh, feature map and then uh, with a higher uh, feature size, like 128 here, and we want to skip to that, so we have to do something about X in order to add it point-wise. Uh, and that's the uh, dot connection here. And as you can see, uh, they define these, uh, they call it projection layers, like projection connections, and they define it by uh, multiplication of WS a new weight by X, and then they add it to the layer, right? So uh, they have different ideas of how to do that. One of them is just adding uh, zero padding, basically. They just add zero to the, um, to the input, the output of that uh, unit, and they just add zero and pass it to the next layer. The other thing is, um, they use a W in order to make it uh, um, the same size as the next unit, which is uh, they are adding a couple of more parameters in order to learn that. And it's slightly more parameters, but not much like to say very deep networks they have. And um, so yeah, that was the whole idea of uh, ResNet. Yeah, of course. And uh, what? So yeah, so if you, if you have like less dimension and you want to add it, you should do something about this dimension and match it to the next dimension in order to point uh, pointwise be able to add it, right? Pointwise addition. So that's the WSH. Just stretching the image. What? It's just stretching. Uh, it's it's like basically you have matrix multiplication and uh, you uh, use like n by n, n by p. So it would be n by p, right? So the multiplication of two matrices, two matrices uh, together, it would be uh, they uh, they make this multiplication in order to find the next size of the next feature map. Do you get it? So m matrix multiplication. Yeah. A times B is one matrix, and B times C is another matrix. When you multiply them, you end up having A times C. So they want to make it bigger or smaller. So this this these are a couple of weights. As a matrix, they multiply it by x in order to find uh, that. And then we learn that. We learn those weights. OK, the weights are but learnable parameters. But this is not a full matrix. It, it should be a, what, 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 what is the form of this matrix? What is the form of this operator? It depends on the x. It depends on the x and depends on the input. Like this layer and the next layer, what are the parameters that we want to project in order to be the same size? So it's just. Uh, calculation of those numbers. Question. Um, so the whole idea of Resna is just you add x the input and to the output so that um, it's much easier to get zero as the fx function than one. one. But 
with this, once you added like a, an extra parameter as a weight, you kind of like, I'm trying to understand how does it not defeat the entire purpose? Because then you're having a, an extra parameter that um, you must train for the input, which the original idea was that you have the input already there. Yeah. Like you have the basically like almost an identity function already there. I, I see what you yeah. So uh, my question, uh, I want to answer it with a question. How many parameters do you think you will add in three uh, projection layers than a VGG okay. of 19.6 billion <laughs> flops? Okay. So, right? So yeah. you're just adding, like, it's nothing compared to okay. the whole network, right? Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. There's one more question there. No, that's good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, let's take five. Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, so I hope you enjoyed your five minute break. Uh, so the experiments that I ran uh, at the time, uh, they won a couple of competitions with this idea and uh, they were uh, rank one in uh, like uh, oil, SVRC, I guess, uh, competition and Coco, um, Pascal challenge and uh, also on Cypher uh, data set. Uh, they had uh, at the time the state of the art results uh, with this architecture. And uh, the experiment of Im on image and data set that they uh, ran, uh, as I said, image and data set is a data set with 1,000 classes and uh, 1.28 million images used for training. 50K of these images were used for validation of uh, our data set, and 100K, which was on the test server for um, testing results. Uh, they used batch normalization. Um, mini batch size of 20, uh, 256, and uh, these are the other hyperparameters that they used uh, for ImageNet data sets. Um, and these are different architectures that they used with different number of layers uh, for ImageNet data set. As you can see here, uh, is um, these are the units that we talked about, different units of um, residual blocks. And then uh, these are the number of layers that uh, they shown uh, in this um, in this table. I cannot. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, I can't show it. So uh, as you can see here, 18 layer and 34 layers. Um, they use uh, this architecture, which was uh, as you asked, wider two layers. They are these two layers of three by three and 64 and 64, and increase the feature um, size, and uh, we go further and further. Uh, after 50 layers, there will be too much uh, comp com computation. And uh, one thing that they did in order to uh, lower the uh, complexity of computation, uh, they used uh, a bottleneck architecture, uh, which uses one by one layers in order to adjust that uh, the dimensionality of the data. So the X that you talk about. So they use this in order to uh, reduce uh, the uh, dimensionality of data. And then they use the convolution. And then again, they turn back to uh, the dimension that they want, uh, like in that layer. And uh, for more than 50 layers, uh, that was the idea. And uh, as you can see here, um, 18 layers versus 34 layers on the ImageNet data set. This is the plain uh, network without any skip connections. And as you can see, uh, the 34 uh, layer has more training error on the data set itself. And using adding that residual networks helped them to gain a lot of um, like boost in their network. And uh, they have a much lower uh, error percentage uh, with respect to number of layers, and uh, which is basically an empirical uh, experiment on their hypothesis at the beginning of let's add this residual layer, right? Why are there uh, the steps, the sharp, sharp drops in the error? So, um, correct me if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong. Um, so usually, um, when you when you're training. You uh, after a couple of layers, you do uh, you change the um, you change the um, learning rate of uh, your training, and that will help to.
get into more uh, deep and deeper. I think so. So this, this is uh, right after the learning rate. No, so yeah, you change the learning rate and you... Presumably reduced. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I guess it was... Uh, it divided by learning rate of 0.1 and divide by 10 when error plateaus. So, you see so here error plateaus, right? Mm -hmm. And then into this. They divide by 10. So 0.1. 0.01, 1,000, 1,000. Um, so yeah, these are results on ImageNet dataset. Um, as you can see, error rates uh, using 10 uh, crop testing uh, the percentage, and uh, for 50, 101, and 152 layers, they are using option B. What does this mean? In paper, uh, as I mentioned, the, re the skip connections that uh, I introduced with WSX. So one option, let's call it A, is to use zero padding in order to pass it to the next layer. The other option is to use WSX, the matrix multiplication by X, in order to project it to the next layer, right? And only for skip connections. And option C was, let's use WSX in all the residual layers, not only changing between the units, which adds a lot more parameters, as you said. Uh, and at the end, they said, uh, what result that we got, based on the complexity of the algorithm, we preferred the B, which adds a little uh, more parameters to the data, and also it's like C doesn't give us that much boost in our uh, performance. And as you can see, 152 layers of um, ResNet gave them the 5.71 error, uh, top five error uh, percentage, which is um, here um, compared to the other set of the art um, architectures at the time. And uh, this is on the test server run of uh, the testing um, data set. And as you can see, uh, ILS VRC uh, competition of 2015, uh, 3.57. Uh, was the top five error the best they got. Uh, and I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they use ensemble of a uh, couple of models that they have, right? So it's like an average of the result of yes. all of them, yes. So they uh, train a couple of networks and they, uh, yes? Uh, a question from Alai. I, I don't know which slide she was referring to, but the question is, does it mean skip connections are only effective if there are more than 18 comp layers? So they mentioned that in paper. Um, they said that 18 layer of plain networks considerably still can learn good enough with our gradient, uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, optimization that we have at hand. But when we go further, it starts to uh, like be worse than uh, before. So they mentioned that it's still good till 18, but we found that degradation is kicking in after more and more layers is added. Yeah. Any other online questions? Sorry? Any other online questions? Uh, just one. Please. Okay. And uh, they did another uh, experiment on uh, Cypher 10 data set, uh, which contains uh, 10 different classes and uh, 4 to 5K images were used for training, 5K validation, and 10K for testing. They also use batch normalization, uh, which we need when we have a lot of layers uh, in order to uh, fight against vanishing or exploding uh, um, vanishing uh, or exploding gradients, uh, we use batch normalization. As I saw right now, one question written big in the screen, what is batch normalization? So uh, in output of each layer that we're going forward, um, we can, if, if we don't normalize the output of each layer, we tend to go to zero. Like we are updating each layer uh, output, right? Like we are updating the weights. So if in the process of updating weights and uh, calculating them. If we don't normalize our output of each layer, we'll end up, we'll end up either going a very high amount of uh, like um, uh, values in our network as we go further, or it vanishes to zero. Basically, we don't see anything else passing through the network anymore. So it's just either zero vanishing gradients 
So no, no, there, there's no gradient, like there's no change basically happening in our data. It's plateaus or just too much, like it's just going uh, crazy. And uh, we have a, a very huge amount of uh, gradients, which is exploding gradients, right? So uh, that's why um, a couple of years ago before this paper, they, um, uh, the, uh, the, the idea of um, batch normalization came. Let's normalize each layer after we calculate the, uh, the outputs of that. So that's batch normalization. So Cypher data set, uh, they use um, this type of architecture, as they mentioned by N. Um, so they have three different uh, output map, map sizes, 32 by 32, 16 by 16, and 8 by 8. And they use 1 plus 2N uh, layers uh, for the first one, 2N and 2N for the uh, next ones. And uh, like uh, in uh, overall, it would be 6N plus 1. Uh, layers uh, for different ends, they uh, ran the experiment. And uh, the number of filters as shown, 1632 and 64, uh, they use almost uh, the same uh, idea, but here uh, they, they, for ImageNet, they say when the error plateaus, we reduce and divide uh, our learning rate with 10, uh, by 10, and here uh, at 32 k state and 48 k steps, uh, they do the same. Um, what is the I guess they're boats, cars. Um, so the question is, what are uh, the classes in CIFAR 10 data set? I guess um, they're boats, cars, uh, yeah. like there are a couple of things. They're objects, actually. Yeah, I don't remember. There are 10 objects. Yeah. I know cars and boats and maybe something like that, yeah. Um, so the results on CIFAR 10 data set, uh, as you can see, there are different uh, number of layers uh, for different ends. Uh, and uh, here, uh, they also ran this experiment for more than 1,000 layers. It's like 1,200 layers. Uh, it's even crazy to hear that. but. Uh, they got, they got the best result for 110 layers. And uh, as you can see, 6.61 plus minus 0.16. Uh, they ran it a couple of times, five times. Uh, and uh, they have the mean and SDD of uh, all results that they had. And that was uh, the best error rate that they got on C410. And they, int an interesting thing here is that they mentioned that for more than 1,000 layers and 1,200 uh, layers that they had, they didn't get a good error rate, as good as uh, 110. And again, the idea is coming up that why and what, what is happening when we add more and more and more, like how much more can we add? So um, I guess that would be a good uh, discussion point that uh, what is happening mathematically, we have Serena here. Uh, <laughs> we can ask any kind of math questions, I guess. And uh, so yeah, so we move forward. Um, this is the effect of number of layers uh, on CIFR 10 data set, plain uh, versus resident architecture, as you can see, uh, increasing the number of layers, increasing the um, error rate on training set, and which is flipped when we add more layers with residual networks and they got the best error rate with 110 layers. And the funny thing is that I guess they even, uh, they don't show 110 layers here because the error was more than 60%. So it's not even shown in this 20% range of uh, the graph, which is crazy. I guess that's the third time I said crazy, so fourth time now. Uh, so what's the difference between the CDN uh, the line you see on the on the right hand, and you see the 120, uh, 100, 110 there. I guess, uh, and then below that you can go even lower. So what those curves? Represent? Yes, I know. And um, so I guess um, these are uh, for train error and test error. Test error. Yes. Any question? Um, so yeah, key takeaways that. Uh, we discussed further, uh, we discussed in depth, uh, a residual learning framework is 
ease the training process and it helps us, as Amber said, a uh, very good point about not being bumpy on, on the cost function that we want to uh, minimize, um, basically, uh, will help us to ease the training process and converge faster. And uh, it, it helps to just use the identity mappings if we don't want to add like information or these weights just can be zero, as I said in FX, uh, can be zero and just be add the identity mapping. And uh, the address integration problem and a solution, empirical solution to that, uh, at least till now, that, uh, to the best of our knowledge for this paper. And uh, they leverage that to use more and more layers, which can help us to uh, build up better and better representation of uh, very deep problems and tasks at hand. And uh, as I said, uh, they um, trained the network for uh, more than 1,200 layers, uh, which was uh, awesome. <laughs> and uh, they won a lot of competitions at a uh, time, and, which was very impressive. And I, I again mentioned the fact that this paper has more than 25,000 citations. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, there are a couple of discussion points uh, we came up with uh, helping uh, to uh, the facilitators that we have today, Rami and Amber. Uh, we're going to discuss, like, uh, feel free to uh, jump in and just uh, tell your ideas about um, these points and also add any discussion points that you have. Uh, if any, and um, so one thing that comes to my mind is that uh, when we see that for more than a thousand layers, we cannot learn uh, as good as 110, what, what is happening, right? what is the gain, uh, the block between us and a deeper representation of the problem, like what is actually the reason behind it. Um, mathematically, or I don't know, like what what kind of other um, ideas can uh, you know can be uh, addressed in order to solve this problem? And I would love to yeah, hear your ideas. I had a question on that. So it looks like, especially on the CFR ten, it's almost like it's overfitting. Like it's getting very close to zero error on the training set. It's, to my eyes, it looks like overfitting. It looks like you want to add some sort of regularization. Um, does so it look like if it was overfitting, uh, training error should be less. The training error. So you overfit on training. Yeah. Basically, was that the case? wasn't it? No, it wasn't. That, that's the thing, right? <laughs> the dash line at the bottom, though, wasn't that the error on the training side? Uh, I guess they don't even have that here. Like, oh, the bottom layer. They have it on another graph. Like, or in the paper, they had another graph that shows that, I'm pretty sure. That was STD of uh, I don't know if they have uh, exactly but yeah, just So uh, how did they control for for overfitting? What do you mean how did they control for So so it didn't uh, overfit right in uh in in test, right? Yes. So there are different uh Approaches that you can mm -hmm. have. Uh, they didn't discuss it much, but uh, there. Like, that was just you, a question. You, you use, yeah, yeah. You, you you usually use uh, regularization. So they just regularized it. And there are different types mm -hmm. of regularization. They didn't use dropout, mm -hmm. if you know what is dropout. Yeah. Uh, but they used uh, batch normalization is one of them. They used mm -hmm. momentum of gradients, uh, another regularization technique, and. Uh, what? Weighty K? Yeah, I guess weighty K was uh, 10 to the power of uh, minus 4, I guess, was the weighty K of adding that to the cost function. There are different types of normalization in order to generalize a better model to a uh, problem, and uh, it would work better in the test set. So that was. Uh, oh, okay. So, <laughs> half of the time. <laughs> Yeah, just want to go back to his point. Um, there, there's another graph showing comparing the residual uh, one one zero versus one two zero two, and then uh, from what it looks like, um, the error rate on the page, sorry. Oh, yeah, here. yeah, right there. Yes. So I, I don't, I, I can't see which one's doing better on the bottom. It's it's uh, purple. Purple is higher, right? Yeah, error. on the top. Yeah, and then. And as you can see on the test set, if 
it's obvious, but uh, here it fluctuates. Less obvious. Yeah, it, it just fluctuates yeah. at the bottom. But I don't know, it's so much closer to the right now. Yeah. So if I cannot zoom further. Yeah. <laughs> The, the paper said the testing result of this uh, 1200 layer network is worse than that of our 100 layer network, although the both have similar training errors. Hmm. Okay, they that's, have that's the same. So they call this the same training yeah. error. So, but somehow. So it's not overfitting because uh, if it were it's to the be same overfitting. Error. Yes, yeah. it said it's so overfitting. Because of the same training error. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, there's a question online. <laughs> okay. Wow, that's funny, you start looking at me. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was like oh, looking at me. Okay, <laughs> can they, okay uh, Alice again, uh, can they use plane for the first 18 layers and add skip connections for the higher layers? Uh, it's an interesting point that... Uh, so when, when they're mentioning the fact that 18 layers uh, is as good as 18 layers with ResNet, so basically, uh, let's say um, we have. Um, I think it could be our um, third. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I will come back to that. But I mean, here, uh, let's say yeah, you, you have yeah, these uh, like 18 layers already uh, trained on your network, and then after that you add more layers. So, uh, but why not use all the uh, residual connections from the beginning. I don't know if any funny thing will happen. Like, I don't know, to, that it might not learn for, because we have those uh, skip connections uh, at the end, it tend to learn something else at the end, but not uh, the first layers. I'm not sure, I haven't tried it, but um, it's a good thing if anyone knows the answer, I would love to <laughs> add it to my knowledge. I mean, it's theoretically possible to have yeah, you like know, not, I mean, normal layers uh, with the residual layers because it's this is just a block. So it's like adding one block to your entire architecture, mm. but you can nevertheless try it. But but there should be uh, uh, there should be a reason to do that. And um, what is the reason we want to do that, right? So I guess like. Uh, what do we love about that 18 layers without skip connections? That we want to stick to it and not having skip connections for the first layers. That's uh, like the idea. Like, what, how how can it help us to have that architecture? You know what I mean? I think that could be uh, um, one of the solution because just think about the new net. Yeah. Unit actually consists of the one downsampling uh, down layer mm -hmm. and another one is up just sampling. up sampling. Up sampling. Okay. So the basically the downsampling layers is basically is, is the address net 34. Okay. And the another side I just um, basically they're uh, adding another the, we call it zero five. Uh, yeah. They, uh, but in 18 layers of plane network we don't downsample. That is uh, because they're, they're they're trying to downsize. Uh, they're trying to uh, upsize yeah. upsampling, so they have to add uh, add some tracks to yeah. uh, to make it mm -hmm. the, the the layer size is bigger and bigger yeah. to up to the original the size they want. Yeah. So, the, but just a half of the units basically they are the resident thirty four. So I think it could be the possible that you have the maybe couple of the uh, regular com layers and you add. The plain layers, and you add maybe just several rest block. And, but it just what as what you talk about that what's the purpose if you wanted to have these architectures? Do you wanted to solve the particular questions? Yeah. Or so that is that. Yeah, it's all. Based I, I, on I don't have hands-on experience yeah. on such a thing, and uh, I don't know if anyone has. But it was an interesting <laughs> point. Okay, she responded. She said the reason why we need to be less flops. Uh, I guess the number of flops added with projection layers is not much compared to, yeah, but uh, that makes sense, like, uh, I guess they had, uh, with all the projection layers, uh, so the option C, if you remember, uh, A, B, C options, so C had all the connections with uh, WS um, matrix weights, uh, matrix of weights, right? So uh, the number of parameters was 3.6 billion flops, and then it uh, raised to 3.8 billion. So 0.2 billion flops added with those projection layers. So it's basically, yeah, 1 18th of the whole network architecture. So I'm like, I don't know. 
Yep. Yeah. Can I ask why uh, they didn't use uh, drop out, or do I understand it correctly? If they would use it, it would be contraproductive to their aim, actually. Uh, their so goal. they they mentioned this drop out. They said uh, based on this. We do not use dropout following the practice in 16. I didn't read it, but <laughs> you can, we can, yeah, we can see what 16 is. Um, batch normalization, accelerating deep network training by reducing internal covariate shift. Yeah, so I guess that that's a good paper as well to read for batch normalization idea. Because, that guys because have. if you use both dropout and batch norm together, to get, uh, it gets was performance worse mm -hmm. compared to is, is there so pick either one either one or yeah. the other. is there a specific mathematical reason behind it or is just experimentally proven as in mentioning sure. 16 okay um any other questions okay so uh the other point that uh ramio i guess wants to talk about uh oh yeah ramio <laughs> wants to talk about uh, is she mentioned, you can talk about it. Yeah, so the skip connections, uh, if you look at the neural language model, uh, the paper by uh, Yoshio Jembenjiu, uh, they have used skip connections in the neural uh, language model. So I wanted to uh, understand, like we could discuss about this, whether, the, whether these specific uh, skip connections in the NLP field uh, is it is it very like how how is it uh, compared to the skip connections in image processing? So I wanted to compare the two scenarios, um, and I wanted people to you know probably discuss about this. Like we we do use skip connections in NLP, and we use it in image processing. So like if if people have worked on both and they can give they can talk about um, how, why do we do that? Then it will be like. Yeah. I think uh, in general, the skip connection helps with flow of information and flow of gradient. So, regardless of the you know, domain that you use it, whenever you want to have a better flow of gradient, it's helpful. And this is why uh, this paper is really important and has so many citations. And this idea has been used in many different architecture across disciplines. I think the concept of uh, residual networks, uh, they have, uh, I, I, I was looking at one of the presentations on YouTube. And uh, what they say is that when you have a general uh, neural network without skip connections, so as and when you start adding more layers, it's only Every layer represents a probability distribution. And what happens is that when you're not using skip connections and you are adding more and more layers, your uh, probability distribution starts moving in a particular direction, like the contours start moving in a particular direction. And what happens is that your point, optimal point, where the network is supposed to converge, it need not be in the direction in which the probability distributions keep on getting added. And that's why we have these problems of your network not converging or degradation or, or because you know the, the training error, of course, if you're if let's say your point is on the surface in this direction, in the right direction, and it's in moving in the like when you're moving the, when you're adding the new layers, the probability distribution is moving in the left direction, then there is no, I mean, there is no possibility that you would encompass the optimal point after a certain point. And that's why the, the training error tends to increase. But when there is, when we talk about uh, uh, the skip connections, if you can imagine this, it's f of x minus x. It's like centering, mean centering something. It's very, it's very, uh, very much related to the concept of mean, mean centering. And what they have observed is that when you have these skip connections added, the probability distribution tends to be concentric. So you have the the actual distribution of the first layer, and then 
the next layer and the next layer and the next layer. The probability, the contours are concentric. So there comes a point where your training error gets reduced optimally because you know when you're moving in this direction, it's concentric. It's like spreading all around in the space. So that's that's one concept that that I heard of. You know the the probability distribution of newer layers is kind of concentric when you have f of x minus x. And this also is related to one of the concepts uh, that you have of VLAD. If you have used the, like earlier, um, like when they were doing, uh, um, you know, computer vision and up, like image processing and all, uh, it was always, like nowadays we directly feed everything into the, the artificial intelligence network and it's just AI. But earlier the approach was we, you, you use computer vision techniques to process your images and then you feed it into your network. And there was one way of processing, uh, if people would have heard of it, it's called as key point uh, uh, feature engineering or key point feature extraction, where what you do is that you have the images and uh, you, you, you don't feed the entire pixels uh, constituting the image, but you, you select the key points in an image. So it could be very simple. It could be corner of an image, the way the corners are, uh, you know, you, you could have 16 by 16, very small pix like um, units, the entire image could be divided into that. Um, and then what they tried was like in image processing, of course, uh, I don't know if, if, if they still do it, but they brought in the concept of bag of visual words. And uh, VLAD that I'm talking about is related to bag of visual words. So in that, if you see, uh, they do something very similar. So when you have, when you're trying to, uh, so when you're trying to encode your, your images um, using the bag of image words, um, what you do is that you try to cluster, you try to create the features by clustering your points um, and then uh, once you have that, you subtract the centroid of that particular uh, cluster. So it, this is very similar to that concept. The residual concept is like that. So you have f of x minus x, so your probability distribution grows around a certain uh, point and certain surface, and eventually it encompasses the optimal point. So that is why skip connections work. And, and the generic, uh, you know, uh, neural network or architecture doesn't work. Uh, one other question, two people are asking if you could give reference to the papers you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> so those references are there in the are section. VLAD is on oh. the paper, I guess. Um, it's... So you can post them on a slide. Yes. Okay. Uh, here. Look for VLAN. Yeah, it's number 18. Uh, number 18. You cannot click and it will. Uh, no, it's going to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it's, he likes so Ramya, uh, aggregating local image descriptors into compact Into compact codes, yes. Yeah. Did you refer, uh, did you talk about paper? Uh, sorry, a video? Oh. Did you mention a video just now? Yeah, YouTube video. Yeah, YouTube video, video yes, yes. Okay, so someone's asking. Yeah, yeah please. Please send that in the center so circle. So they're, they're actually a series channel. of videos. So okay. um, I started off with uh, one University of Waterloo. Uh, it's a video. Uh, I don't remember the name of the professor. Uh, so he was talking about the two different types of features that we uh, design using computer vision. And then, um, so he talks about Fisher and uh, the VLAD, and I also read, read this paper, aggregate. Uh, over the weekend, I was reading this paper, uh, okay. the 18 paper. I think you can mention that. It's very useful because. Do you remember the title of the course? The course. Yes, it's called it's machine, it's intelligence. Okay. Machine, machine intelligence. Machine intelligence. Machine intelligence. The fifth lecture, if you can. <laughs> oh, precisely. Okay, um, so um, 
I guess Amber uh, had a point about what's the fundamental reason of the degradation? Is there conclusive evidence that shows it's not caused by vanishing gradient or something else? It, it was in the paper. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what the paper said, but they pointed to the evidence. Uh, yeah, so I think the third section has it. Uh, when they have shown that degradation is happening, but the parameters are not, they are not like tending to zero. The gradients, like vanishing gradient was not observed. Yes. But then um, there was degradation observed. So I think this yes, is so, right. So they checked, they checked the gradient norm after yes. each layer? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I checked that. And the reason they they didn't find that uh, a gradient vanishing problem is because they are adding the batch norm. Yes. So, so that is the they place one trick hmm. to. That was the reason that they yeah, added batch normalization. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, I, I put it discuss, uh, discussion point just because I didn't find any conclusive evidence to show that they are completed. These two reasons are completed independent mm -hmm. the uh, vanish, um, vanishing degradient problem and the degradation problem. So I just want to open to the public, yeah, yeah. to public yeah. and to find if there are any. Amir, do you have anything? <laughs> or they, they are the mathematically the fundamental reason for the degradation because every time you check with the paper or the blog, they said it is just based on the observation because they found. Yeah, the yeah. observation is. Yeah. Yes. Um, any ideas? If it's a sigmoid, then it's easier to explain, but if it's a relative, is it because they they always clip the negative part? Yeah. yeah. And over like when you flip a few times and then it just vanishes. You might guess. I mean the degradation problem itself. Not the the reason problem. behind it. The Sorry. reason behind uh, the fact that we cannot uh, use our solvers, the current solvers that we have in hand, in order to uh, add more layers and don't care. Like what is happening? Why, why this degradation happens in general? Like uh, that's basically something that I thought may be worth discussing. Okay, I'll look at gradient descent in general. Yeah. In fact, it's uh, uh, help us to nudge different weights and update weights. Yeah. And the deeper, let's go starting from the last layer. If we uh, go back, this nudge, this input, I mean, help uh, to change the weight will be, you know, it, it will change again. And when we go back and back, like if I give you a clue and then this clue will be uh, distributed among different weights and move to the next layer and that clue again will be distributed. When I go deep and deep, since I don't have optimal uh, weight for the layer at the end, mm -hmm. it's kind of, kind of, I give you a little bit of information and then you share that uh, kind of clue or information with others. And at some point, you, this, uh, you the final, yeah, the final uh, gradient is not that informative or not that helpful, considering the, you know, limitation that we have, uh, considering the amount of data and also the complexity of our model. So you're basically saying it's something like a physical phenomenon of dropping a stone in water. And when you get further from the, that point, there's less and less information. Uh, I guess that's sort of vanishing gradient uh, in, problem. In vanishing gradient, we have uh, we gradient gets close to zero. But if we have, if it's not zero, but it's not that informative anymore, because when we go deep and deep, I mean, how can we say uh, gradient is informative or not? So uh, that's like mathematically speaking, uh, if we have a gradient, we can move towards it or like to lower the error, but why uh, it doesn't happen? So in informative gradient is, you know, intuition wise, is the one that helps us to find the optimal ways yeah. or almost optimal, optimal ways. And when this one doesn't happen, means that those gradient is not informative enough. So it cannot lead us to uh, optimal ways. So definitely the gradient that we have is not informative. Okay. It's not that informative comparing to short number of layers. I see. To, to your point, uh, usually these kind of network, 
that you have wider at the at the top and, and it goes like narrower down. So if gradient gets propagated back, so you're actually spreading yes, thinner yeah. and thinner and thinner as you go go back to the top. Yeah, but that's, when you uh, yeah, when you send back that gradient, really the network is uh, getting wider and wider. So it means that you uh that gradient will be distributed among way more yeah. than there are. And I guess like the, the point here is that uh we also calculating gradients in a much like much larger uh, dimensionality. So let's say we have ten layers and x number of parameters, and it's an x-dimensional problem that we want to optimize, right? Like uh, find a local minimum. But then we add ten more layers; it's two x more uh, expensive and two more uh, two x more uh, complicated problem. It's kind of uh, a different domain, not like it's different. Uh, yeah. Has anyone seen the method of training these networks? And it's kind of off topic, but I think it touches on this idea that the gradient spreads out too much. Um, training a network where the learning rate differs across the network, such that each time you add a new layer, the learning rate is higher for your new layer, but the original, you know, upfront learning rate is dropped significantly. So you're not, you're not. As sensitive to changes around the beginning, it's more just you know later on. Like you mean adaptive learning rate for different layers? I, I wouldn't say, say adaptive in necessarily that they themselves learn themselves, but like yeah, in, in the sense that you do drop them off. So I guess it could be adaptive in a way. The further we are from the beginning, the different. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess uh, as you train and keep training, you yeah. shrink it towards the beginning, and as you add layers, it grows. I guess Yang uh, said. I may have seen that, but I don't remember. I think I've seen this uh, because um, we we were implementing this uh, units architecture, and there was a point when um, it stopped learning anything, the network. So um, so I, I'm working with uh, another person from U of T. So. Um, that person suggested uh, some sort of a scheduler, uh, which does exactly that. So when your training, uh, I mean, when when it when your training set stops learning, when you you see that it's not learning, you you modify the learning rate accordingly. Yes, um, I think there's a function, there's a scheduler that does that, that modifies the learning rate according to how much you're learning and. You know the the rate at which do you see any change in the training loss, basically. Or the training changes, loss. Change across the network. So if the network is the same, but the learning rate over here might be different than it is over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's there. I think yeah. he's, he's talking about changing learning rate like layer wise or layer yeah. wise. Yeah. Yeah. Layer wise. You're talking about temp oh, okay. temporal wise. Yeah. Uh, by the way, fast AI. I think they have, they have like learning rate scheduler built in by default. I think enabled by default. Please share your links. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like yeah. Yeah. Please for now. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that's interesting actually because the like when you're doing the back propagation, it's like you do it across the entire network. I don't know if um, like you can uh, you could do that as in you know one layer having. Uh, learning rate independent of the other layer. I don't think so. It's not possible because your gradients are calculated. You're going back and all. Is it so possible? You can calculate them stages. Yeah, you're summing up all the errors, yeah. right? Yeah. So when you're summing up, you have um, alpha i, basically. So you have your gradient i, like for that layer, and all the calculation. Then you have alpha i uh, added to the computation, I guess. That's like, interesting, actually. Yeah. Uh, we are almost out of time, so okay. those who haven't asked questions, and do you have questions. any questions? No? All right, let's thank Nasud and the facilitators.